Welcome to today's show. It promises to be an absolutely eye-opening uh, debate around food, around the heart, around uh, the brain. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Dr. Malcolm Kendrick, who's written many a good book, Statin Nation, uh, The Great Cholesterol Con, both amazing books. Actually, my favourite one isn't either, either of those. It's his other one called Doctoring Data, uh, which is a great book that goes behind the newspaper headlines revealing how research is done, about uh, how a lot of it is funded by pharmaceutical industry or, or by the food industry. It looks at all the different ways of doing a scientific uh, study. Uh, it looks at who funds the studies. It looks at uh, controlled, randomised, uh, interventional studies, what statistics are used. It is the single best book I think I've ever, ever read. I think I've read it about four or five times now as well because it's just so amazing to find out the truth about what goes on that you and I probably have no idea about. It really is an eye-opener. And then uh, later on we'll be uh, joined by uh, Ema Maxweeney, uh, who is a neuro neurologist. No, I can't even say the word. She looks after our brains. Uh, she runs a great clinic down in London, and she'll be talking to us a bit later on about what food uh, we need to be consuming to look after our uh, uh, mental well-being. Uh, and if it's your first time to our show, uh, welcome uh, to the Food Bank Show. Uh, we're here to inform, hopefully to entertain, but at the same time raise money for food banks across the UK. Right now more than ever, there are more people that need food put on their table. Obviously in the financial crisis that has sort of followed on uh, from COVID, more people need our help right now. And we've partnered with the Trussell Trust who run 1,250 food banks across the UK, and we're asking you for two things. We're first of all asking for any financial donation you can make, but also remember next time you're in your supermarket, go to where the collection point is, and all big supermarkets have them, and there's a list on the side of the screen here. Uh, if you can put in cans of fruit, cans of vegetables, cans of fish, uh, or UHT milk and so on, it would be greatly, greatly appreciated. Uh, right, let's jump straight in this morning. Let's welcome uh, Dr. Malcolm Kendrick uh, from what looks like a sunny Cheshire this morning. Well, it's a bit cloudy, but it's not too bad. I'll be getting out later and get my, my vitamin D levels up. <laughs> well, I, I, want what, I want whatever you're taking, mate, because every time I see you, you look younger. Yeah, well, that's because you're getting older. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting the same. Now, before, before we jump into uh, what food we should be eating for our heart, uh, give us a bit of an update on COVID, if you would, because I know you're massively into researching and looking at data. Yeah, well, uh, it's, uh, there's so much data that uh, my brain has officially exploded, so I've given up. But um, just one thing, uh, I did a blog uh, a few days ago just saying that it looks like vitamin D is very important in both stopping you getting infected and if you do get infected meaning you're less likely to become seriously unwell uh, a number of doctors i put this up on there's a thing called doctors net and doctors in the uk hate anything to do with vitamins with a passion the idea that any vitamin could do you any good is instantly dismissed out of hand but in fact there has just been a recent paper which has come out showing that um, uh, northern italy uh, surprisingly italy northern italy spain and uh, and Switzerland, the elderly there have very, very low vitamin D levels. And if you look at the association between the countries, the vitamin D levels and deaths from COVID, it's, it's very powerful. Uh, and uh, I think it's also very important in the UK because um, the what they call the BAME, the Black Asian Minority Ethnic Groupings, are disproportionately affected by COVID. Now, there are obviously other reasons for this uh, than, than just vitamin D. But we know that the black Asian uh, uh, minority groups um, are are low in vitamin D generally. This is not a surprise because the reason why my skin is is pale and your skin is pale is because when human beings moved from the equator further north or further south, our skin became pale because we needed to get as much sunshine and the conversion to vitamin D as possible. That's why we have this color of skin. So it's not amazing to suggest that, that black Asian minority people living here are just not getting enough vitamin D from sun exposure. And, and this appears to be the case. So I think it's really important for people to start either taking vitamin D and I think D3 supplements and or just get in the sun and sunbathe. I mean, don't blast yourself into a crisp. 
but you can get vitamin D levels up very quickly with fairly short amounts of sun exposure. So I am very keen to promote this message and, and I think it will significantly help. Because another thing I was looking at was that, that New Zealand, which is just coming to the end of its summer when COVID hit, although it's got a smaller population than the UK, it's about five million, five and a half million, I think, which is a tenth of our population. Their total number of deaths from COVID stands at the grand total of 19, which I think, and, and Australia has also had very low rates of death. And in fact, India has had 700 deaths in total from a population wow. of 1.3 billion. Yeah. So it does look as though we need that sunshine on us. We need our vitamin D and, and it is really important. So that's end of the public announcement. I'll pick up on those. I mean, it's, it, you know, it's fascinating. Um, and, uh, you know, vitamin D, vitamin C, zinc has been banded around on the programme a lot from lots of different doctors. Um, uh, two things I'd like to pick up on there. Uh, first one, as you said, uh, on your doctor, you know, doctors seem to hate the fact that any vitamins are good for absolutely anything. What, why do you think that is? Uh, it seems to have become positioned. I think the problem is that people who promote vitamins seem to are, tend to be seen as at the cookie end of the homeopathic sort of spectrum of medicine, which again, most doctors hate. So the people, I think it's to do with the sort of people seem to be promoting uh, vitamins and this type of slightly different approach are, are, are pigeonholed into this, this, you know, you are not proper doctors, you don't understand evidence, you don't understand anything about medicine, you know nothing about nothing. And so they've, they've kind of painted themselves into a corner on this one. Uh, and, and when it comes to, I mean, I, I know that vitamin C, uh, somebody was speaking to me that Facebook have decided no one is allowed to, to say anything about vitamin C being mm. beneficial. And they banned any videos or any content where they could find anything about vitamin C. And this is absolutely insane because I was reading a very interesting paper. I haven't blogged about this yet because there's only so many hours in a day, but um and I'm, I'm also working full time in the, in the front line. I am a hero. I even got a pen that says I'm a hero. So <laughs> I am a hero. Uh, in fact, I've seen 22 patients who've died of COVID. Oh. Um, um, oh. I am uh, on the most of front line -ish, front line that you can get. So anyone who wishes to criticize me for, <laughs> for this, they, they can get stuffed. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but essentially with vitamin C, what seems to be happening is that when people get infected, and you can see this with other serious infections, is the body starts to strip through its vitamin C supplies to protect itself. So in fact, there's, there's evidence, and, and I'm, I'm going to look at this in more detail, that, that you can end up with vitamin C, you can end up virtually with scurvy because the body just starts using vitamin D. Animals who get infected or get seriously ill start overproducing vitamin C to protect themselves. But we can't do that because we don't make our own vitamin C. So what, uh, what, what seems to be happening is we use up our vitamin C stores, then we become effectively scrobutic, which is a technical term for scurvy. And then our cells start to give in. Uh, and especially the, the, what they call the endothelial cells that line the blood vessels. So these cells start to die off because they're under direct assault from the COVID virus. At which point, of course, as these cells give in, this exposes the underlying uh, blood vessel to the blood and this starts to create small blood clots. Uh, this happens in sepsis and happens in other serious viral infections. So you get a thing called <clears throat> disseminated intravascular coagulation, which just means widespread in the blood vessels, little blood clots forming. These blood clots start to jam up the organs and the organs start to fail. And also we seem to be seeing specifically this happening in the lungs in COVID. So what you're getting is this um, pulmonary intravascular coagulation it was just a study came out two days ago on this and people are going oh why is this happening why is this happening I went, well it's obvious why it's happening it's the same reason why it happens when you get sepsis your blood vessels are getting attacked serious what we call vasculitis and one of the things that can protect this because the cells are driving through vitamin c that they need vitamin c so there is evidence that if you give people vitamin c intravenously along with an anti-inflammatory a steroid plus, plus uh, thiamine, it's one of the B vitamins, that this can, can protect the, the, the lining of the arteries and the blood vessels, the small blood vessels, and, and lowers this risk of disseminated intravascular coagulation. 
which is really important. And there's evidence showing, I mean, this is, this, the Chinese have been using vitamin C in high doses since the start of this. There's a lot of American centers doing this. And yet YouTube has decided in their scientific stupidity and ignorance to say that anyone talking about vitamin C should be banned. Well, you know, I'd like there to be a reckoning on this because if it does turn out, and I believe it is turning out, that vitamin C, IV, and high doses is protective against death from COVID, then the people making these decisions should be named and shamed and yeah. told that you should not be making these stupid, stupid, ridiculous, dangerous, and damaging decisions because you are affecting people's health. So that's yeah. my next public announcement has ended before no. I get too annoyed with them. No, no, look, page 276 of A Statin Nation, your, your book, uh, you list all the things that you think we should be taking for the heart. And you know, way before COVID was even known, you wrote that vitamin D and vitamin C are good for our heart, along with uh, K2, uh, CQ10, uh, and a few other things. So, yeah, you are, pardon the pun, speaking from the heart. And I think the fact that you're, uh, you know, you've written loads of books and you're still a, a GP on the front line, really faced with COVID. Uh, there is no way, and I know you, for those who don't know, we know each other, we've known each other for quite a long time. I know you're, you, you just talk from the heart and, and you're on the front line, seeing people die and your passion comes across that it's just crazy that we're not looking at some, you know, <laughs> fairly inexpensive ways of, of helping ease the problem. Oh, yeah, well, I mean, I think it's, well, there is a big pressure from the, I'm afraid to say, commercial pressures on here. We have, uh, you know, the, the really super hyper expensive antiviral drugs, which have been tested and found to be, from what I can see, much less effective than vitamin C. But they are now being pushed as this miracle, well, not a miracle cure, but a benefit. And these things are going to cost hundred billions, billions are going to be spent on these things. And the yeah. benefits, as far as I can see them, are significantly less than giving vitamin C. But I'm not saying vitamin C is a miracle cure. I'm not saying everybody given COVID with vitamin C is going to live and, and no one's going to die. But I mean, the benefits are much greater than these antivirals, which are hugely expensive and almost entirely appears to me without benefit. And in fact, they've, they've manipulated the statistics in these trials outrageously, as they always do, to try and make them appear more beneficial than they are. So, you know, I'm afraid it's same old, same old. You think in the middle of a crisis, where, where we're trying to find things that would work and, and, and that, that we would be, we would be the, the same old games are not being played, but of course uh, they are, you know. Yeah, it's sad, isn't it? Because, you know, vitamins are vital for life. That's where the word comes from. Um, but of course, they don't make big pharma lots of money because you can't patent a vitamin. Uh, and somebody once said to me, vitamin C, you know, if, if it did come from the drug industry, it'd be heralded as the best super drug ever. And like you say, yeah. you know, it's not going to work for everybody, but then drugs don't work for everybody, do they? I mean, you know, the thing that shocked me when I got into learning all about health was that, you know, I would assume if my doctor prescribed any drug for me, then it would 100% work because that's why I've been told to take it. But quite often drugs, as in certainly uh, one of your favorite topics, uh, statins, you know, you have to treat lots and lots of people to get one positive outcome. Um, yeah. And that's not something I'd ever heard as a, a layman before. Oh, yeah. Well, then in the first days, I mean, if you have, they call these things number needed to treat. How many people do you need to treat to get one benefit of whatever you decide that benefit is? And uh, when it comes to like antibiotics, the number needed to treat is very close to one. Um, and so some people don't get benefit from them. When it comes to things like statins, the number needed to treat can be in the hundreds, in some cases, the several hundreds, um, which means that basically a one person out of 300 or one person out of 400 might get some benefit from it. The other 399 get no benefit whatsoever. Uh, uh, so this is, yeah, it's again, can you identify people who are going to get benefit? I mean, that's that's the kind of holy grail. But of course, to an extent, I'm afraid the industry doesn't like that very much because what if we found here are the 299 there's no point in giving the drug to. Instead of treating 300, you'd be treating one out of 300. So the benefit and uh, to the company, the profit margin would fall through the roof. So although they pay a kind of lip service to this kind of let's look at the genetics and let's look at who's going to benefit, they're not entirely keen. But but the I mean the, the, the new reality is they're creating these things called monoclonal antibodies, which are mind-bogglingly expensive. 
like a hundred thousand pounds a year, or in some cases fifty thousand pounds per one injection. Oh. Uh, I mean, you're like injecting a supercar in a tear stream every time you do it. Uh, and of course, the uh, the health economy can't can't have everyone getting these because that would just be the end of all of the world economy in one go. Yeah. So they are trying to do more of like who's going to benefit from this, which in one way is good, but another way it just means instead of giving 50,000 people a drug that costs one pound, they're giving one person a drug that costs 50,000 yeah. pounds. So, so they're just, again, uh, I'm afraid, um, retaining the profit margins here, which is, which is, of course, not surprising, but there we are. I, I, I want to add one more thing to that, and then we'll move on to some positives about what we can do uh, to make our heart healthy. But let me just add to what you've just said there, because what we're going to see is, and we've seen this, like, like you say, with Facebook, YouTube, trying to shut down anything with the mentioned vitamin C. Yeah. <clears throat> there will be people that vitamin C won't work for, but there are also, yes. but, they, but what will happen is everybody will focus on those where it didn't work. Whereas with drugs, we seem to only ever focus on the positive uh, and not talk about numbers needed to treat. And I'll just quickly quote an article by, uh, with Dr. Alan Rose, who was once the vice president of GlaxoSmithKline, uh, a big manufacturer of drugs. Uh, he went on to say uh, in the independent newspaper that the vast majority of drugs, more than 90% of them, only work in 30 to 50% of people. And that was somebody from that industry. Um, well, let's see uh, how many people will be helped with vitamin C and vitamin D. Right, let's get back to your favourite subject. Uh, well, it's one of your favourite subjects. Um, uh, the heart. Beer. <laughs> <laughs> beer, yeah, let's talk about beer. Um, the heart, what, what food should we be eating to try and keep cardiovascular disease at bay? Yeah, well, um, food that looks like food, I think, is... Um, is um, I know that you know, we know Zoe Harkham and uh, her view is if you have to le read a list of ingredients on the side of the packet, chuck it away and eat something else. Um, so I think in general terms, highly processed foods are bad and and unprocessed foods. Good or uh, the, the, this is going back a few years now to when they last produced statistics. Uh, the Ukraine... Um, and the lowest cons consumption of saturated fat, at, I think it was 7.8% of calories came from that. And they had a heart rate, which is the highest in Europe, and was also six times that of France. And, and wherever you look, you can find absolutely no association between saturated fat consumption and heart disease. Um, so it's just a complete nonsense, and, 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 it, and it always has been. Great. No, great. Great answer. Um... Uh, still, there are articles that, that say eggs are bad for your heart because of cholesterol. Yeah, well, I suppose uh, uh, it's, it's absolutely no. In fact, the, the American, uh, the ADA, I think the American Diabetic Association, um, recently said this cholesterol has no impact on the cholesterol level in your blood. But, you know, I don't believe that's important. And removed eggs as a nutrition of concern from their list of, of, of nutrients that you should be worried about. In other words, it's nonsense. You go back, the first person to, the person who started the whole century, the fat nonsense, Ansel Keys, his first hypothesis was if you eat cholesterol, the cholesterol in your blood rises, the level in your blood rises, and you die of heart disease. He did a series of experiments and could find that eggs had no impact on your cholesterol level in your blood. Eggs have, by the way, got the more, the highest concentration of cholesterol of any, any food stuff. So he changed the hypothesis at that point to fat. He then later changed it to saturated fat, and then he changed it again and again in all sorts of directions. But so it was known almost from the very first uh, studies that, that eggs were completely healthy, and I would call them the superfood. They've got everything in them you need because if you, as I sometimes say to people, you know, how, why why does an egg contain so much cholesterol? Because it takes an awful lot of cholesterol to build a healthy chicken. End all. We need it. It's absolutely essential. Eat as much as you like. It's not going to make any difference. Yeah. Well, we had uh, 12 eggs for dinner last night. Then we jumped between three or four of us. We made a big, we got some steak, we got some gammon steak. And then uh, I did this thing in my fridge called my SBD uh, recipe, which is sell by date. 
what's just gone out of date, all right? All the eggs have just gone out of date because we have so many eggs. I found them at the back of the fridge and we just made this massive big thing. We chucked loads of veg in and great stuff. Uh, next quick fire question. Um, you can lower a very high LDL cholesterol uh, through diet alone. These are questions that people have been asking over the last couple of weeks. Can you lower your LDL from diet alone? No, not any significant amount. Um, the evidence is a bit is a bit um, conflicting. Uh, I think that if you replace one type of fat with another, so if you replace saturated fat with polyunsaturated fats, then your LDL level can go down a bit. Uh, but this is almost certainly due to the fact that polyunsaturated fats also uh, tend to contain plant stanols and they compete with cholesterol for absorption from the gut. So you can get uh, some reduction. However, I noticed that the research that David Unwin carried out, where he put people on very uh, high fat, low carb diets, he saw absolutely no, has seen no difference in total cholesterol or LDL levels in any of uh, the people he's studying. He's studied several hundred now. Um, and I trust his research before I trust a lot of other people's research. So there may be some, there appear to be some, and I've heard and I've had many uh, people speak to me about this, hyper-responders who, they're, when they eat a high saturated fat diet, their LDL cholesterol goes through the roof. I've never seen any absolutely clear-cut evidence for this. So I'm not entirely sure uh, the validity of this. I and can see no mechanism by which it would do it. Yeah. But perhaps there are such people. And of course, that was a bit of a crazy question for me to ask you anyway, because I know you're a firm believer that we all obsess about LDL cholesterol. It seems to be the first thing we all ask our own doctors every time we go in, what's my cholesterol level? Yeah. And yet it seems we're all barking up the wrong tree because uh, LDL seems to, certainly in older people, if it's too low, be more dangerous than if it's too high. Yeah, well, the vast majority of people who die of heart disease are over 65. Uh, and once you reach the age of about 55 to 60, the lower your LDL is, the, the more likely you are to die prematurely. It's not a huge difference, but it exists. And, and, and also the more likely you are to die from cardiovascular disease. So you just look at people and go, well, if this is supposed to be killing people, why doesn't it kill people when they get older? It's a bit like saying, if you smoke cigarettes up to the age of 65, you die of lung cancer. But if you smoke cigarettes after 65, it protects you against lung cancer. Right? Well, how does that work? Yeah. But uh, people are capable of holding weird and, and strange beliefs in their head. You know, it's amazing. Absolutely. Uh, loads of questions coming in for you. Um, uh, Dev Patel says, totally agree with your vitamin C. Uh, 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 he says he really likes you because you're not afraid to challenge the establishment and corruption. Um, Jenny Price says, I've been low carb for six months. Latest bloods were 7.6. Uh, CAC scan 101. Why aren't more people taking a CAC scan these days, do you think? Well, I did recommend that you had to be very careful about CAC scanning. Um, well, first of all, they cost about 400 quid. Yeah, you won't get one done. Uh, if we're talking UK, you're not going to get one of these done on the NHS. So you're going to have to go and pay for it. And the problem is part is I have a problem with there's an awful lot of things that could cause your CAC this is coronary artery, amount of calcium in your coronary arteries, which is evidence that's been built up of plaques in your arteries over years. So what you're, to an extent you're doing is looking at your cardiovascular past as well. And, and you, you can't be sure which, you, which factor has, has caused this calcification. Because has it been, has it been um, because you've got diabetes? Has it been because of X, Y, Z, because you smoke, because of pollution, because uh, lead pollution, uh, there's, there's, there's an awful lot of things that could do it. And so the problem is then then what do you do? If you don't know what caused it for sure, how do you turn around? I mean, you can say, well, your CAC scan is high and you you then must do something about it. So uh, I do know that uh, Ivor Cummings and I have had a few battles over this. And, and the other problem is that some people, it's not a good idea to see it. They kind of give up and helpless. It's like, oh my God, I'm going to die effect. So you have to be very careful that you're not doing harm when you do tests and examinations uh, as well. And you have to be absolutely certain also that you can reverse that finding or slow it. Uh, and the research is not hugely strong. So whilst I would agree, some people are, who, are, who are probably the likes of yourself who says, right, I'm going to sort everything out. I'm going to see this as a positive step. I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to 
reduce my consumption of carbohydrates, I'm going to take exercise, I'm going to blah, 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 or whatever it is that you want to do. I'm going to take more vitamin K, I'm going to take more magnesium. You can, you're, you're a kind of positive action taker. But a lot of people are less effective than that. You show them a scan and they're kind of like, oh my God, I'm going to die. So, so you have to be careful about doing scanning like this. You always have that, to be that, careful that's prob- about it. Is that probably true for many measurements that we'd go and ask for a doctor like, you know, uh, so I do take an annual medical, although I, I didn't last year, but I normally have one every single year uh, because I am that way and I will react to those results. Um, but can we, for certain personality types, is over testing a bad thing then? Well, they did a study on looking at all cardiovascular screening programs that have been done around the world for the last, I think, about 50 years. I think they call an odds ratio is a thing like, if the odds ratio is one, it means that there's been no benefit or no harm from it. Um, and what they found was when they analyzed all the cardiovascular screening programs that have been done, that the odds ratio, LE, the benefit that you could achieve from this in dying from cardiovascular disease or just overall mortality was precisely one. In other words, they had no beneficial effect on the population, wow. nothing, wow. zero. So again, I mean, there's probably a reason for that. And you could probably split that down and say, well, some people went off, found that they were at risk and did something about it that was effective. Some people find they were at risk and said, oh my God, there's no point, I'm gonna die and I'll give up and actually carried on worse you know, behaviors. So, so you have to be very careful with screening and scanning. You know, generally, I'm a, I'm a great disbeliever in um, screening for diseases. Um, but I know people love to get a figure. Oh, you've got 101 on your calcium scanning, and now it's 100. It's like, oh, my God. They, you know, some people are motivated in that way, and that's that's beneficial. But I think you, you need to be careful, especially with coronary artery, artery scanning. I can list you off the top of my head, for instance, if you gave me time and I could, my memory was not failing. 150 things that could cause atherosclerosis to develop. You get a coronary artery scan, it says you've got a calcification. How, how do you know which of these you've got? You know, I mean, really highly trained athletes have higher calcium scores than sedentary people. So what we're going to say to people, stop exercising. You know, right. and, yet, and yet their overall risk of dying is no different than people... Uh, uh, who are the, 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 the actual overall risk of heart, heart diseases is reduced, even though we've got a higher cost calcium scan. So the test itself has has issues. Yeah. Um, and I would say I would recommend getting one if you, you know, you know what you're doing, you want to see where you are, you know exactly what you're going to do, you're going to get a scan, and then you're going to have another one in say two years time just to see have the things I've been doing had benefits on me. And you, and, but I think you have to wind people up quite well before you lose a calcium coronary artery calcium scanning on them personally. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the same advice I give people about your bathroom scales. <laughs> you know, some, some people, I think, don't have them. You know, talk to them first about their personality and da, da, da. Others, if that's what's going to motivate them the next day, if they've lost a bit to carry on, you know, cutting down the carbs, great. But for other people, the worst thing to do is actually jump on the scales at all. Uh, I know, question- well, they, they, they put on two pounds and then despair and give up, you know, yeah. even though that's just because they didn't have a pee or, yeah. you know, or, different or whatever time, it was. Or different times yeah. of the day. Uh, question. Uh, I know the answer to this one. Uh, <laughs> I, can't, I can't wait. I can't wait for you to ask, answer this one. Uh, are vegetable oils good for you? Uh, well, I fry um, steak in vegetable oil, so <laughs> it must be good for you. No, are vegetable oils good for you? It depends a bit on the vegetable oil uh, and what they contain. Uh, I mean, many people, olive oil, for instance, contains more saturated fat per gram than steak, which I suppose a lot of people are unaware of. I would tend to stay away from a high, what they call omega-3 vegetable oils. Um, And you'd have to look on the list. I haven't memorized which ones are omega-3s. Sorry, omega-6s. But the the, the omega-6s ones tend to be the more artificial ones. Um, They call themselves polyunsaturated as if this is a good thing. But actually, if you have too many omega-6 fatty acids in your system, this is not a good thing. And one of the great ironies, of course, is that McDonald's used to fry their chips in beef lard or beef tallow. And then everyone went, oh my God, that's saturated fat, how unhealthy. So they started frying them in, in polyunsaturated fats, which are then converted in a deep frying process to trans fats, which are the most unhealthy things you could put into your body. Yeah. So all of this making things healthy has made things unhealthy. Yeah. So are vegetable oils bad for you? One small amount, no. Olive oil is fantastic. 
um, uh, and, and beneficial for d different reasons than it's um, than it's um, polyunsaturated fattiness. Um, but in general, we reduce if you can. Yeah. Yeah, and I would say uh, vegetables. It's, a, it's a, I suppose it's a bit of a strange topic because. You could, you'd argue that olive oil is a vegetable oil because it is a vegetable oil. But vegetable oil, when it says vegetable oil, normally hasn't got any vegetables in at all and isn't derived from vegetables. Uh, it's normally derived from corn and other things that are GMO. So stay clear is my advice if it's called a vegetable oil. Uh, Stuart says, does the good doctor have any knowledge uh, of chaga mushroom powder, good or bad? I just, I've never heard of chaga mushroom powder. All right, I'm going to pass on that one. I don't know what it is. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to pass on that one as well. Um, right, lots of questions coming in for you. Uh, can low vitamin D and low B12 cause things like strokes? Um, cause. I'm not very keen on the word cause. It's like increasing of risk and decreasing of risk. Um, I think that having low vitamin B12 is a bad thing. Very, uh, it can cause nerve system damage. I've seen people with uh, what they call neuropathy, which is loss of feeling in legs and fingers due to low vitamin B12. Does it cause strokes? I'm not aware of any evidence on that. Can vitamin D deficiency cause strokes? No, but low vitamin D deficiency can damage the, um, the uh, cardiovascular system, which I suppose indirectly can increase your risks. So not absolutely directly, but but I'm a great believer that we need to have vitamin D levels up in the, not the suboptimal range. It's one of the things I pointed out is that when vitamins were first discovered and the deficiencies, that the diseases they caused. So the major deficiency of vitamin D was, was rickets. So children had bent bones and people got osteoporosis in their bones and, <coughs> and they all fractured. So they said, well, what level do we need to get to to stop that happening? Which is kind of, that was then considered the level we needed to achieve. No one then said, well, can this stuff have benefits beyond that on things like heart disease or cancer or infections? And that research has never been done. So there's a huge argument about what is the, the optimal level of vitamin D. And I would always tend to say to people, it's higher than what you've got yeah. uh, virtually. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. I think uh, that we have to be very careful because, you know, again, my understanding of vitamin B12, I was at a lecture on this, I was at meetings with people, was that the, 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 the healthy range of vitamin B12 was established in 1947 in the UK on seven patients, all of whom had pernicious anemia, which is caused by a lack of vitamin B12. And it's never been changed since then. Wow. And the reason why I think that's probably true, although I've never managed to source this, is that the healthy range or the, what they call the, the range that is considered optimal in the UK goes from 160 to 960, which is, how can anything have a range that wide? Yeah. Which sort of means to me, they don't really know what the healthy range is. In Japan, for instance, the healthy range is over 400. So the Japanese are looking at ranges three times as high as ours and would say, if you were three times as high as what we consider okay, you're still vitamin D to B12 deficient. So you have a huge problem with the vitamin levels, the, the levels of vitamins in your blood what do they mean because because no one's ever really done the proper research on yeah. okay we know how to prevent to prevent pernicious anemia but actually what's the healthy level yeah. we know how to stop children getting rickets but what's the healthy level that we need and 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 until this work is done which which has not been done i think we're well, i would always err on the side of having more rather than less yeah and it's true isn't it with b12 the older we get the body gets less efficient and absorbing it so as we no one yes there's, well there's a thing called intrinsic factor that needs to link to it to allow it to be absorbed uh but also there are many drugs that can prevent this and one of the most one of the things i'm more concerned about nowadays is is what they call ppis proton pump inhibitors that's any drug like ending in azole so it's a metprazole pantoprazole manzoprazole these drugs all inhibit vitamin b12 absorption they also inhibit uh, uh the absorption of magnesium uh, and, and anyone who's on any of these drugs, uh, and they knacker your sodium levels as well. So long people are taking these drugs long term, I think you have to be especially careful uh, about lacking vitamin B12, etc. Uh, thank you very, very much for that indeed. Um, 
Uh, that also goes on almost to the next question from uh, Daniela. She says, how much Vit C, Vit D per day, please, for safety for, for all our organs? Confusing info out there. And she says then, I love your approach and directness. You should be the health minister. Wow. <laughs> Wow! Big, big promotion well, I think there. I, I like this woman. She's right. <laughs> <laughs> I would. I don't think I'd be politically correct enough. I would be losing my job in about five seconds. <laughs> but how much vitamin D? I don't know for sure because people. It depends on them. You go outside and spend an hour in the sun, and you you'll be swamped with your vitamin D. You produce about ten thousand units per twenty minutes. Um, if you want to take it as a supplement, I personally take uh, about 7,000 international units a day during the winter. Yeah. I tend to go outside in the summer and I stop taking it once I start getting a bit brown and getting a bit of sunshine. For vitamin C, if I take more than two grams, then I, as I told you, I end up spray painting the toilet. <laughs> so <laughs> my, my guts don't like more than that. I take about two grams a day currently. Um, and whether that's sufficient, I can't say for sure, but that's as much as I can take. I, I'd imagine a gram a day for most people is probably is sufficient. That's really good advice. Um, uh, going to buy your book, which should be the National Bible. Uh, people like you inspire me to continue fighting for justice, uh, was from uh, Daniela. Um, he's, he's worth buying all three of them, Daniela. They are all yeah, absolutely. And, and for all your friends. And for all your friends, indeed. Uh, uh, if someone has had a, oh, we've, we've kind of caused, uh, no, we haven't, we haven't done that one. Uh, if someone has had a stroke, what are the key and best tests to determine root cause to avoid it happening again? Hospital doctors don't find root causes, they just give drugs. Well, yeah, that's a tricky one. I mean, strokes can have many different causes I mean, uh, and, and very different mechanisms of action that can cause them. You can, some people have got what they call a hole in the heart, which is a, a gap between the, uh, the atrium and clots can shift across. They're more common than you'd expect. It can cause strokes in younger people. There are conditions such as antiphospholipid syndrome or Hughes syndrome, which is a clotting system disorder, which needs a specific test. You can have it due to atrial fibrillation, which is where your heart is not is pumping inefficiently and it produces clots that go into your brain. You can have um, uh, plaques in your arteries in your neck, the carotid arteries that they can then go up into your brain. Uh, I would tend to say go and get, if you had a stroke, try to let the medical profession look at you for that one because they are pretty good at that actually. Uh, and and I, I, would, I, would, I would definitely say go get it looked at properly. Thank you very much for that indeed. Um, so many people asking you questions. No. Uh, right, Dev says, uh, if statins inhibit VIT-D uh, as it lowers cholesterol, then why are statins prescribed post-stroke? Doesn't seem logical as low vitamin D can also contribute to high blood pressure. Yeah, well, it doesn't make any sense. Although uh, there are some people, myself included, who believe that statins actually um, have uh, vitamin D effects on the body. Because you've got to remember that uh, cholesterol is turned into vitamin D mm -hmm. in the skin. That's how it's synthesized in your skin. Uh, anything that inhibits the cholesterol pathway must have its cholesterol-like properties and therefore vitamin D-like properties. So there is some evidence that statins have vitamin D-like properties and therefore you can get some of the benefits of vitamin D through statins. Now, the other thing, of course, the, the whole stroke thing is major study published in the Lancet about 15 years ago, they looked at um, stroke, risk of stroke and cholesterol LDL levels and could find no association whatsoever between the level of LDL in your blood and the risk of stroke. And therefore you say, well, how can lowering LDL possibly reduce the risk of stroke if the two things are not? causally associated the answer is well you can't yeah and that's that yeah yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah um i have read that cholesterol levels fall in the summer months when we have more vitamin d um yeah uh, that, that, well that, that's true whether it is because the cholesterol is getting synthesized into vitamin d yeah or or there are other reasons for this i'm not entirely sure i i it may, I don't, I don't see enough vitamin D being produced to, to 
to be the reason why your cholesterol or LDL levels drop at that time. Um, but I, I think there are other reasons, but I'm not entirely sure what they are. Um, but I would also say that sunshine itself is not just about vitamin D. Um, a study in Sweden, or was it Denmark? I think it was Sweden, which showed that women who avoided the sun uh, were as at risk of dying as women who smoked. So in other words, avoiding the sun wow. is as bad for you as smoking yeah. in life expectancy reduction. Right. And that's probably, well, vitamin D has a part to play, I'm sure, but uh, also sun, sunlight on your skin produces nitric oxide, which lowers your blood pressure, opens up your cardiovascular system, helps to protect your endothelial cells, and is generally all around a fantastic molecule to have. So if you avoid the sun, you're not going to have so much nitric oxide. And that is also a very damaging and dangerous thing. So sunshine is not just vitamin D, and I'm sure it's not just nitric oxide. I'm sure it's many other things. As I say to people, if you believe in evolution, you must believe that we have adapted to be healthy to the environment in which we grow up. And the big shiny thing up in the sky has been shining down for 4 billion years. To me, the idea that getting sunshine on your skin during the summer is bad for you is just completely insane. Um, and then whilst I always say, don't burn yourself to a frat. And if you're a fair skinned person living in say Australia, don't spend 12 hours a day in the sun, you don't need it. But for us living in this latitudes, we need the sun on our skin. It is fantastically beneficial and healthy for us. And I did look at a paper some years ago, which I've looked at others showing that people who had higher levels of sun exposure are 50%, women are 50% less likely to get breast cancer. Men are 50% less likely to get prostate cancer. And men and women are 75% less likely to get colorectal cancer. Wow. Wow. So probably the best tablet on the planet is There's a big shiny one in the sky. A big shiny yeah. one in the sky. <laughs> oh, I mean, it, it, it's so frustrating for me because my mom's uh, she turns eighty next week, and uh, about, it was about thirty years ago she was told by her doctor to avoid the sun, and she doesn't remember what she got Alzheimer's. She don't remember anything, but uh, bless her. Um, but she doesn't remember why. But she's it's so ingrained now she'll never get out in the sun, and uh, we go on holiday lots, and if she ever comes with us, she won't leave the, the villa, or she'll she does come out of the massive hat or the umbrella. And it's just, it's just so, so annoying because the evidence is there. And I've, I've, I've read this and seen so much research that, yes, people can die of uh, you know, skin cancer from the sun. They can if yeah. they have way too much of it. Well, but, far well, more, right. but far more people die of other cancers from not getting enough sunshine. Yes. Well, I think well, the total number, just to give you some association of the figures there, the death rate from malignant melanoma, which has stayed pretty constant, is so about 2,000 a year in the UK. The death rate from breast cancer is about 25,000. Death rate from prostate cancer is about the same. Death rate from colorectal cancer is about 40,000. So if you can reduce those by 50%, you're reducing the total deaths from cancers by about 50 to 60,000 versus 2,000. And also the evidence that excess sunlight causes malignant melanoma is very, very weak. Um, about a study in British dermatology I was looking at, which said we can find no evidence that sun exposure causes malignant melanoma. Wow. Um, now, everyone will say, oh my God, you must be wrong, you must be wrong. And I say to them, well, obviously no one's done a, a controlled double-blind placebo study and got 20,000 people and stopped them in the sun for 20 years and got another 20 and stopped them going into the sun for years. But a study, one study, which is probably very telling, is people who had malignant melanoma, who had them removed, who were then obviously sort of very accurately studied for how many of them then developed second malignant melanomas. Um, the ones who had the greater sun exposure, which they measured by damage to the skin or whatever, um, were less likely to develop another malignant melanoma. So I look at people and say, I know you say this all the time, and I know you claim it as a fact, but I know also that in the United Kingdom, the two professions in, in the UK, the two workforces that get the least malignant melanomas are, are building workers and farmers. <laughs> right. And they're the ones outside in the sun. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Right. Look, I could talk to you all day long, uh, but let's just wrap up because I know that you're very, very busy with the NHS uh, at the moment. Um, let's wrap up then. So uh, we, we know the saturated fat, as long as it's natural saturated fat from animals and, and you know, olives and things like that, we don't believe that causes heart disease. We don't believe 
uh, eggs cause heart disease. Um, so let's have uh, three or four, uh, as the name of the title, three or four of your favourite things we should be eating to keep a healthy heart, and then we'll let you get off and save the world. All right. <clears throat> well, I still do. I think um, a nice bit of uh, oily fish is good. That's definitely true. A nice steak is true. Um, what's the saturated fat? I try to say is eat grass-fed steak. Do not go for so much grain-fed or animals that have been fed rubbish themselves because that ends up in the animal itself. Eat eggs. They're very good for you. And I'm trying to think of a fourth one. Let me think. Uh, <laughs> nice salad with a bit of olive oil, lots of eggs, and uh, and that'll do for you. That's great, Malcolm. Mate, love, love talking to you. I could, I, I could spend all day talking to you, but I know you're really, really busy. Um, and uh, again, frontline worker, working very hard up there in Cheshire. Uh, we applaud you all. And uh, it'd be great to get you back on uh, in a couple of weeks, if you wouldn't mind, sir. Yep. Give us a shout, Steve. Will do. Thanks take very care. much. Take See care. Uh, so, Dr. Martin Kendrick, frontline, you heard uh, about the number of cases he's been dealing with, uh, with COVID, his belief around... Uh, vitamin D seemed to be the, the theme that came out loud and strong uh, in the conversation there. Uh, before we go to Ema, um, let's do today's food fact, because I think my, it sort of ties into the subject quite well, actually. Um, so today's food fact, I didn't pick on one food. I picked on a family of vegetables. They're called the cruciferous family. And the way I remember it and the way I teach my children, the word cruci cruciferous sounds a bit like crucial for us crucial for us. Uh, the cruciferous family includes kale, it includes cauliflower, uh, it includes about 10 really super, super healthy uh, greens. And if you can get those organic, you're going to be eating what we call nutritionally dense food. And what we believe uh, at Primal Living is that as a nation, we are overfed, but undernourished. The reason why we've got more obesity than almost any other country on the planet, apart from America, and Mexico and a few others, but we're right up there towards the top of the league, not one that we should be proud of. Uh, but we have so much obesity and we have so much overweight because we're eating too much of the wrong things. Obesity is pretty much only caused by eating the wrong food, making the wrong food choices. And those are the packaged foods, the highly processed foods. And the great thing about the cruciferous family is that they're all from nature. They are there. And if you can buy them organic, you're going to be eating such nutritionally dense food it is amazing and then uh, along with Malcolm's uh, oily fish and uh, grass-fed uh, beef you can't and eggs you can't go far wrong at all so we've talked about the right food for the heart um, let's talk about brain food uh, next because uh, sadly my mother uh, suffers uh, with uh, Alzheimer's and um, I want some advice on what food should we, uh, should we be eating uh, to have a healthy brain. Um, let's speak to Dr. Ema McSweeney. No, we haven't got you there yet. Okay, well, we'll, we'll come back in just a second. Um, uh, let's uh, talk about, uh, let's, well, let's have a look at um, some more comments that we've had on the uh, website, uh, David Morris says, thank you for this terrific interview and all the others and for the great work you're all doing for the food bank. Thank you for that, David. I, I, could, I could listen to Malcolm uh, so, so much. I go skiing uh, once or twice every year and uh, last year Malcolm uh, was going to come uh, on our skiing trip with us because I could just listen to him all the time. But sadly, uh, he couldn't get away from uh, his, uh, his practice. Uh, he's a very, very, very hardworking GP indeed. Uh, Mech Champ says, I wish uh, we could clone you. One amazing and sensible Dr. Bravo. Um, you know, I, I, I said the other day on air, I said, our NHS is amazing. Uh, doctors, our nurses, and all the staff behind the scenes, they are all absolutely amazing. But the one thing I would like to see changed, because I believe at the moment the NHS really stands for the National Hospital Service. And, you know, I love all our GPs, but as Malcolm and any doctor that's been on the show will tell you that in the five or year, six years that they're at med school, there is no focus whatsoever on nutrition. 
Uh, some have said they've had no lectures on it. Some have said there was maybe one lecture or maybe one day on nutrition. And the fact is this, that we need to really shift our country. Rather than being great at, you know, sort of trying to cure, 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 drugs, you know, diagnosis, you know, try and fixing the problem, let's get better, as we try in the business world, at prevention. Prevention has got to be better than cure. There's a saying that I love that says an ounce of prevention beats a ton of cure. Uh, and I would like to see us having a refocus uh, on the way our doctors are trained. Like I say, our doctors are brilliant. All our NHS, our nurses, everybody's brilliant. But let's try and change some of the training that we have. Rather than just being there to diagnose what's going wrong, let's start talking about how we prevent things from going wrong uh, in the first place. And that must come from food. It must all be about food because good nutrition means health. It's as simple as that. You know, the, the, the only cause for obesity, the only cause for obesity is wrong food choices. Uh, and we're getting, and it's not our fault, those of us that are overweight. I was obese for 25 years and that's why my book's called Fat and Furious. I'm furious that actually the truth is so simple. Um, but we're all being brainwashed by big corporate, we're being brainwashed into what food to eat from advertising, just like we were with smoking for so, so long. And then, of course, big pharmaceutical companies, well, <laughs> they want us to get ill because that's where they make all their money. Um, Jack, how are we doing? We, I haven't got it yet. We're, we're trying to get uh, Ema uh, McSweeney on. Um, she uh, has a clinic called Cognition uh, Health, uh, in uh, re Recognition uh, Health, uh, based in London. We're trying to uh, connect with her uh, right now. Let's have a look, see if we've got some more questions coming in um, and some comments. Uh, thanks for the great advice, uh, says Stuart Griffiths, uh, talking about Dr. Uh, 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 Malcolm Kendrick there. Um, so many people found that an absolute fascinating uh, chat uh, that we will definitely make sure we get Malcolm uh, back on uh, another show. And just a quick reminder of his books, uh, A Statin Nation, his, his talk about how uh, his belief in statins, he talks about the numbers needed to treat and uh, Statin Nation, a great, great book. Uh, the Great Cholesterol Con uh, talks about pretty much the same thing, but very much looking uh, at the evidence uh, around uh, cholesterol. Uh, but my favourite book that he ever wrote uh, was called Doctoring Data. And that, for me, was a big lesson about start, you know, sitting back every time I read a, a newspaper headline and think, what was the motivation behind that? Uh, and uh, when I was uh, interviewing Malcolm the very, very first time, I went home. I said to my wife, I've got to come up with an acronym for everything he's taught me. And I came up with the word crimes. Uh, and, and therefore, and let me explain, explain crimes. It's an acronym for, when you look at a newspaper headline, I don't know, uh, statins reduced death rate by 40% or something like that. You, have, you need to know, was it C? Was it a controlled trial? Did they find thousands and thousands of people that are very, very similar? Was it then randomised? Did you then separate those two people into one group you gave the drug to and one group that you didn't. So was it controlled? Was it randomised? Was it interventional? Did they change one thing and one thing only? Then uh, was it meaningful? Was there enough people? Was it measured? Uh, also, the really only thing that matters is life extension. Did people live longer? That's the E. And then the S is what type of statistics did they use? Because there is a massive difference in the way you can represent data, whether you are looking uh, when, certainly when you're looking at percentages, um, uh, it can make a massive, massive uh, difference. In fact, in uh, <laughs> Malcolm's book, he says the difference between absolute numbers and an absolute percentage, um, and, this, and this is the, the crazy, crazy thing, is in the same piece of research, when they look at the benefit and when they look at the side effects, they will actually use different statistic uh, ways of looking at things. And th th he said there is a difference as multiplication <laughs> and division. It's just absolutely crazy the way we report a lot of this data. So do get that book, was my point I was trying to make, uh, Doctrine Data. It will teach you to really understand how a lot of these headlines are written. Uh, how are we doing, Jack? Uh, we still are struggling to get uh, uh, Ema onto the show. Um, let's remind you as well about the Food Bank show, uh, why we're here. We're here obviously to inform and to educate, uh, but we're also trying to raise money for the food banks across the UK. Uh, here's a little film explaining exactly that.
Last year, food banks in the Trussell Trust's network distributed almost 1.6 million three-day emergency food supplies to people in crisis. That's a 19% increase from the previous year and 73% more than what was distributed five years ago. The main reasons for people needing emergency food are benefits not covering the cost of living or delays or changes to benefits being paid. People are being pushed into poverty because there isn't enough money coming in to cover the costs of essentials. It's not right that anyone is forced to turn to a food bank as a result. We all have a responsibility to play a part in ending hunger and poverty in the UK. Together, we can make it happen. This can change. So uh, this is a little game that we play <laughs> in my family uh, and we call it Primal or Not. And uh, it's really, really interesting. Uh, if you get one of these, you can get them from uh, Amazon, it's where we got ours. Uh, and we were playing Primal or Not with the children. So for example, are apples primal? Well, the answer to that one is, are you trying to lose weight? If you're trying to lose weight, then I'd avoid the apple. <laughs> apples are good for certain things. I may give you a little bit of vitamin C but they also come with lots and lots of sugar. So, you know, you'd replace the apple maybe with the berries, the blackberries, the blueberries, the strawberries, apricots as well, also full of sugar. So we wouldn't say that was primal. Asparagus, absolutely fantastic asparagus. So this is a really interesting game to play with your kids, even if you haven't got one of these, just sort of list a whole load of foods, cut them all up into bits of paper and just start to discuss them because it's really important that we educate our children on what food is healthy and what food isn't healthy. But not only that, because it also depends on, and this is why I don't believe in the Eat Well guidelines, it also depends on, you know, metabolically, how you are. So the, the, the food guidelines that we have today, and this is something that I'm trying to lobby against uh, through Health Daddy, that is the current Eat Well guidelines that our government recommend. Trouble is, that's what the army then feed our soldiers on. That's what our hospitals feed our patients on. That's what our schools feed our children from. And the problem is that if you are metabolically challenged in any way, so if you're overweight trying to lose weight, if you're diabetic or pre-diabetic, if you've got Alzheimer's, if you've got cardiovascular disease, all the things we keep talking about on, on this show, then you really have to cut down on the processed carbs. We're not saying get rid of all carbs because carbs are in cauliflower, carbs are in lettuce, carbs are in onions and so on and so forth. But you need to learn that all the processed carbs is pretty much the main reason, virtually the only reason that we gain weight. Therefore, if you are diabetic, pre-diabetic, obese or just overweight and you're trying to lose the weight, you're trying to you know, win that bulge battle uh, that I fought for 25 years myself, you can't add exercise carbohydrates. You just can't. I tried it for so many years. I walked to the North Pole. I spent time with the Maasai. I've run so many marathons. done loads of adventures, but the entire time I was a beast. So you can't out-exercise a poor diet. And that's why my book's called Fat and Furious. Uh, I talk about my 25 years of being overweight and furious about actually how simple it is to lose the weight once you understand the actual basics of food. If you want to find out more, then please do visit us at primalliving.com. Um, if you loved today's show, could I ask, and Malcolm was absolutely fantastic, I really apologise that we couldn't get uh, Ema on. Uh, we will make sure we get uh, try and reconnect with her and get on another day. Um, but Malcolm was absolutely fascinating, wasn't he? And if you would like to spread the word and help get more people to the channel, the more people that get here, the more people we can get healthy, the more people we can get healthy, the more people we can also get to donate uh, to the food banks of the UK. So if you could help promote our channel, we would really, really, really greatly appreciate it. Give it the thumbs up down below, maybe share it, uh, and also don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you're new to us, and then uh, we will be able to let you know uh, every time that we put a new video up. And a huge thank you to a company, I'll, I'll full disclosure uh, at the beginning to say we are associated with this company, but a big thank you to Jewelry Maker, uh, who this week uh, is their birthday week, I think, and they are uh, doing some jewelry kits that they're selling with all the profit uh, going uh, to the Trussell Trust and the food banks across the UK. So big thumbs up for everybody at Jewelry Maker. Their website is jewelrymaker.com.
.com. And if you're looking for a new hobby during lockdown, uh, anything associated with crafting uh, is very, very good for our anxiety levels and our mental well-being. Crafting, one of the best things you can do alongside things like mindfulness and getting out and exercising. Uh, thank you very, very much for joining us today. Massive thumbs up to Dr. Malcolm Kendrick and we will see you uh, here again tomorrow. We have uh, tomorrow uh, Dr. Asim Malotra, uh, who, if you've been watching the news lately, has been on the BBC, he has been on Sky, I think he's been front page of many of the newspapers, he's certainly been in, inside all of them uh, talking about the links between uh, being overweight uh, and uh, COVID and uh, I think one of the reasons that he's been so popular is he's been talking about uh, Boris and how severe it was for Boris because Boris apparently is 16 stone in weight uh, and 5 foot 9 which means he's probably uh, over 30% body fat so probably in the obese category and uh, that's why uh, it hit him so hard and uh, uh, that's what we'll find out from Dr. Asim Malotra tomorrow. Take care, God bless and we'll see you then.